Good morning. Thank you for worshiping with us today. You know, there are four dreadful words that parents fear when they're in a car with their children or with their grandchildren. Can you guess what they are? Are we there yet? I mean, hearing these words can make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It can feel like someone has just kicked you in the kidney. It can sound like someone blowing a shrill whistle in your ear. Are we there yet? It has been at least five and a half weeks since the COVID-19 restrictions were put in place by our governor. And the big picture would say that this has not really been a long period of time, but it seems to me like it's been a really long period of time. I mean, to me, it seems like it's been forever. You can't go here, you can't go there. Don't come near anyone, stay in your house, wash your hands, wear a face mask, sanitize everything from groceries to packages. Don't do this, don't do that, day after day. Makes me wanna connect with my inner child and cry out, are we there yet? I had shared with you how strange it is for me to deliver a message to an empty room and how strange it is not to see people's facial expressions or see their body language. At an electronic pastor's meeting I attended, other pastors shared the very same struggles. I know you have to do the best you can given the situation, but that doesn't eliminate the feelings of coldness of sterility, of distance, and a lack of personalness. In my spirit, I want to cry out, are we there yet? But I know the answer is no, not yet. I know this quarantine will not last forever. I know that eventually the virus will come under control. I know that at some point the restrictions will be relaxed and everything will go back to normal. I know that at some point, we'll be able to gather together as a church family like we used to gather. I know one day I will not need to share a message with an empty room. As such, it would be good for us to focus on the meantime. What should we do until we're at that point? When we are there? Well, beside the physical precautions, it's important to tend to spiritual and mental precautions as well. You see, in fact, tending to mental and spiritual needs can be just as important as taking physical precautions as these restrictions continue. I really appreciate how the American Baptist Churches of Michigan's executive minister is concerned about the health of his pastors. On Monday the 6th, he invited a clinical psychologist from Wheaton University to meet with us for over an hour. And he shared suggestions and perspectives which could help us during the times that we're asking, are we there yet? Likewise, I would like to share with you some suggestions and perspectives to help you persevere in this challenging time until this challenge passes and things return to normal. So let me tell you what these three things are right up front. We need to, one, draw near to God, we need to hold on to hope, and we need to encourage one another. I look at these three things and the passage of Scripture from where they come, which we'll look at in a moment, and I see kind of a Trinitarian element to it. Father, Son, and Spirit. We're to draw near the Father. Jesus is our blessed hope, and the Spirit strengthens and encourages the church. So let's look at today's scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through 25 together. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approach. 
There is so much that we can extract from this passage of Scripture. I certainly don't want to rush through it, so I ask for your patience as we glean as much of it as we possibly can. If you notice, there are four verses in this passage that we're examining. And with the exception of one verse, all start in the very same way. Each starts with two words, let us. Now verse 24 is close. It adds the word and, it says and let us. I wanna comment on these two words for a moment. Let is a word that means to allow or to permit. It's used as a verb, an action word, something that we are to do. From a negative or from an opposite perspective, it means to not prevent or forbid. The second word is us. Us is a plural personal pronoun. It does not mean just you. It does not mean just me. It includes, it includes both you and I, or us. The word us is also not limited to just you and I, unless you and I are the only ones who are being addressed. Now, because the book of Hebrews is addressing the church at large, rather than just the church at a specific location, us covers a broad range of people. The first, let us, has to do with drawing near to God, verse 22. The author of Hebrews says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. The priority is drawing near to God. And the remainder of this verse sets the guidelines. We are to draw near to God in sincerity, in faith, and in holiness. Sincerity means that we draw near with our hearts, with our very beings. We don't come in a superficial manner. We don't come out of obligation or guilt. We draw near with our hearts in love and in holiness. The book of James says the same thing. In James 4, verse 8, we read, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Clean hands and a pure heart. This is always the way that we are to draw near to God. Who, as James says, will then draw near to us? Do you realize trying times are opportunities? Opportunities for a person to draw near to God. Why? Because we're miserable. I mean, we need help. We need relief. We want deliverance. On the other hand, trying times are also opportunities for us to drift away from God. We become more focused on our circumstances than we are on our relationship with God. It's so easy for us to dwell on our misery. It's easy for us to be consumed with focusing on our adversity. And the more we think about it, the less we focus on anything else. And suddenly God is no longer in the picture. Don't let this pandemic cause you to drift from God. Instead, it is important that you draw near to him. This is an opportunity for you to live out your faith, an opportunity for you to put your faith into practice. So let's do this, shall we? Let us draw near to God. How? Well, you know some ways, don't you? I mean, first of all, you can pray. Communication is an essential element in all relationships, including your relationship with God. You can give thanks. The scripture tells us that we're to give thanks in all things. You can worship God privately and publicly, like we discussed a few months ago when we studied the concept of worship. You can live, live for the glory of God. Whatever you do, whatever you face, whatever your circumstances may be, do all for the glory of God. So these are some of the ways that you can draw closer to God. Do those things. The second let us is found in verse 23, which reads, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Here the action that we're to take is to hold on to the hope that we profess. 
We're given the manner in which we're to do this, as well as the reason why we should. We are to hold unswervingly to the hope. Unswervingly means in a constant and steadfast, dependable and loyal manner. The reason why we should hold on to hope is because the one who promised is faithful. Waiting is hard, isn't it? I mean, whether we're waiting for Christmas morning to arrive so that we can open up presents, whether we're waiting for the stay-at-home restrictions to be lifted, whether we are waiting for this pandemic to end, or whether we are waiting for Jesus to return, waiting is hard. And for me, the hardest part of waiting is that I cannot control and I cannot hasten the thing or the event for which I'm waiting. Like most of you, I like being in control of certain things, right? I mean, however, I can't make Christmas morning arrive any quicker than it does because I'm not in control of time or space or matter. I cannot control when Governor Whitmer will lift the stay-at-home restrictions. I cannot control when the coronavirus will be wiped out in our state or in our country or even in the world. And I certainly, certainly cannot control when Jesus will return. I cannot hasten it. I cannot hinder it. Therefore, while I wait, I do what I can. I do what is required. I pray that God will bless my efforts, including the waiting. And I leave any and all results up to him. I do what I can. And I leave the rest to God. You know, this always reminds me of that Keith Green song, He'll Take Care of the Rest. Part of the chorus goes like this. Just keep doing your best and pray that it's blessed. And Jesus takes care of the rest. What are we to keep doing our best by? Well, by holding unswervingly to the hope that we possess. What is that hope? Well, let me address it from two perspectives that seem to go hand in hand. The first perspective has to do with forgiveness of sin and life everlasting with Jesus Christ. This is a, a very brief summary of God's plan to redeem a people for himself. It's a very simple description of the benefits of salvation. Forgiveness of sin, life everlasting. The gospel is, as Paul tells Titus, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, Titus 1-2. Later in this letter, he elaborates, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life, Titus 2, or Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. We hold on unswervingly to the hope found in the gospel message. But we also hold on unswervingly to the one whom the gospel points to, Jesus. You see, the gospel is not just about a bunch of information. It points to a person and how to enter into a saving relationship with that person. That person is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. As believers, we are in Christ and nothing, nothing can separate us from his love. In him we have new life. In him we have new birth, a living hope. This truth caused the Apostle Peter to break out in a declaration of praise in his letter to the church at large. He wrote, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1.3 This new birth this living hope, secured for us by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is part of God's divine plan that was put in place, as Ephesians uh, chapter 1 says, before the creation of the world. And nothing and no one can alter that plan. God will bring it about. 
for he is not only capable, he is faithful. As the scripture says, God, who has called you in the fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. 1 Corinthians 1.9. As I had mentioned at the very beginning of this message, I want to share with you three suggestions and perspectives to help you persevere in this challenging time until that challenge passes and things return to normal because we're not there yet. So I've covered the first two, draw near to God, hold on to hope. The third suggestion that I'd like to share with you is as challenging as the previous two. In fact, it is especially challenging considering our Current circumstances. It's found in Hebrews 10 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. In other words, let us encourage one another. To spur means to stimulate or to excite or to insight. Another translation puts it this way. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. When I, when I read the word stimulate, I think of our recent condition, our current circumstances, and how our government had approved a stimulus package designed to help its citizens in a financial way with the hopes of helping keep our economy from falling into a recession. And the idea is to give people money that they can spend, thereby stimulating our economy. Maybe some of you have already received such a check. You know, you can look at verses 24 and 25 as a spiritual stimulus package. Now this package is not designed to help our economy avoid a recession, it's designed to encourage one another. And there are three parts of the stimulus package that will help us get through this pandemic because obviously we're not there yet. We're to stimulate one another to love. We are to stimulate one another to good deeds. And we are to stimulate one another to assemble together. These three efforts are challenging enough when things appear to be normal but during an adversity like this, like the one that we're facing, it's even more of a challenge to carry out these actions. But even so, we have to do our best to carry them out because these efforts are a vital part of the Church of Jesus Christ. They are a vital part of local church life. You know, as you know, we can't do the things we used to do before this pandemic struck. We cannot go where we want to go. We cannot meet with people like we used to meet. There are many areas of our life that are currently restricted for health reasons, and probably more are coming if people don't follow the current restrictions. Many of you are feeling cooped up, feeling a little bit stir crazy. Some appear to have more free time on their hands because they can't spend it the way they used to spend it. So putting this stimulus package and the play is needed because it will benefit others. It will benefit you and it will bring glory to God. So let me briefly tackle the first two parts together. How can we stimulate one another to love? How can we stimulate one another to good deeds? Well, the needs are there, whether we're facing a pandemic or not. However, given our present circumstances, our methods may need to change in light of our current situation. The term good deeds in verse 24 is a reference to what we do as a result of being in Christ. Another term for good deeds is works or good works. These are the fruits of being in Christ Jesus. They should not be understood as ways that we can earn God's favor, nor should we look at them as a means to salvation. We know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 remind us that salvation only comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It reminds us that no one can work their way to heaven. No amount of good works can ever secure salvation for us. Whether they are what we produce as a result of being in Christ. And they are always directed towards others. The great commandment. 
is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with our very being. It also includes loving others who are created in the image of God. Notice how these three efforts are essential to one another. Love results in good deeds. Because we love God with our very being, we love one another as well. You see, our love for God is not expressed in a vacuum. It is displayed in how we interact with others. The love we have for one another must produce the fruit of good deeds or works. Now, good works has a two-pronged effect. It affects the ones who are on the receiving end, and it also affects the ones doing the good deeds. So as such, both the givers and the receivers will not only benefit from the fruit of good deeds, their love for each other will deepen. Love feeds deeds. Deeds produce love. An environment for this to take place must then be cultivated. And this environment is expressed in the phrase, our own assembling together, Hebrews 10, 25. Now the idea of assembling together certainly includes gathering together as believers in one place for a specific religious purpose, such as engaging in corporate worship. But the root of this word also includes the idea of coming together, of standing side by side, coming together to stand against something or someone. Because of government restrictions, we cannot assemble in one place to worship God as one body the way we used to. And while we have been posting a new and what I hope is a relevant message on our Facebook page each week, it's a far cry from gathering together face to face, side by side like we used to. But for now, it'll have to do. But we can still assemble together, although not physically, to stand side by side so that we can stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Again, we can't live out our faith together in a vacuum. Can't live it out in isolation. We can assemble together in other ways to stand against discouragement. Our circumstances have changed, but that doesn't mean we give up on stimulating one another to love and good deeds. Although Hebrews 10.25 clearly indicates that some will give up. For some it has become a habit. But don't let that happen to you. Don't give up. I cannot give each and every one of you comprehensive steps that you can take to engage this stimulus package, especially while you, we are in this waiting process, but I can make some obvious suggestions. Usually when we gather together in one place, we meet maybe for an hour to an hour and a half. Why not still set aside that hour to an hour and a half? to assemble together with others, to figure out ways that we can stimulate one another to love and good deeds. An hour and a half out of your week. Maybe you need, maybe you need to, to grab your phone and maybe you need to text someone. Let them know what you're doing. Let them know how you are. Ask how they are doing. Message someone. Maybe... You communicate with others through Facebook messaging. Why not take out your phone and use it in an old-fashioned kind of way? Picking the phone up and calling someone, hearing someone's voice. Maybe you even want to do a FaceTime. How are you doing? How are things? Do you have any needs? You can pray for someone. How can I pray for you during this time of waiting, during this time of restrictions. And if possible, maybe you can meet those needs within the restriction guidelines. Our pandemic is certainly very discouraging, but we can remain encouraged. Are we there yet? No. But someday we will arrive. So let us not give up. Let us keep living out our faith together for the glory of God.